Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 11. <clears throat> John chapter 11. I'll be reading verses 1 through 53. John 11, 1 through 53. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who had poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters went to, sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, The sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews were tried to stone you, and yet you are going back? Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the, day, in the daytime will not stumble, for they will see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas said to the rest of his disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the, re in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she, rep she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. After she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews had, had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticing how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing to, she was to see the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and, and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of him said, Could not, could not he have opened the eyes of the blind man, but kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there had been a bad odor, for he had been there for four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I, th I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped in strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary had, had seen what, what Jesus did and believed him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing? They asked. Here's the man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. 
Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was the high priest of that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that no man died for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but for, this, but for also the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for demonstrating your love for us by sending your son to die for us. For you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten son that whoever believes in him will never perish but have everlasting life. For you did not send your son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. And Jesus Christ, we thank you this morning for loving your life so little that you came to this world as the Father sent you and you laid down your life for us. You are the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I pray this morning, God, as we look at this story that's focused on a resurrection, that we would see the sum total of your love in the fact that you sent your son Jesus to die for us and that Jesus died for us. May this and this be alone be the measure of how much you love us. Whether or not the sun is shining or it's raining, whether or not we're in a spirit or in a season of joy or of mourning, that we would look to the cross as a definitive proof that you indeed love us. Help me this morning, Lord. Keep me tethered to your word. Give me spirit-filled words. May my speech be seasoned with, um, with, with salt. May it be gracious. And may those who hear, hear with the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. There seems to be a consensus in this generation, in an increasingly, as I said, secular world, that the Bible is archaic and it's highly irrelevant for our lives today. How could people who lived in a different time and a place, a different context, have anything to say to people like us? And if they do speak to us, how does that have any meaning? How does that affect our lives? A lot of people don't think the Bible has any impact on their lives whatsoever. But I hope you're excited about God's Word this morning, especially John 11, because if you read John 11, you will see that the Bible is deeply and intensely concerned with things that science doesn't provide answers for. Like, why does the world exist? Not how does it exist, but why does it exist? What's the point of all this? Why do I have to bury my child? Why do I have to bury my parent? I mean, John 11 is... Jesus meets us in John 11 in the midst of life's most difficult questions. Why did God let this happen? If you would have been here, our brother wouldn't have died. Jesus wept. Some Jews said, see how he loved him. While others said, surely if he's the son of God, he could have stopped this man from dying. The great question, right? If God is good, if he loves us and he cares for us, why does he let all this bad stuff happen? And so if you're hurting, or if you find it just hard to be a human, I mean, John 11 is, is food for your soul because the Bible doesn't just turn a blind eye to our questions and to our grief or to our disappointments or to our frustrations or to our anger. It, it, it meets us in the midst of them and gives us an answer that we wouldn't expect. An answer that you can't get from anybody else or anything else. The resurrection of Lazarus has everything to do with us today, even though we didn't see it. It has everything to do with us, even though we didn't know him. I think sometimes we have a tendency to come to texts like this and say, 
You know, Lazarus come forth, and the man came forth, bound with linen strips, and we think, good for Lazarus. But what does this text say to me? And what I want to suggest this morning is this text, the act of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, says the same thing to us as it said to Martha and to Mary and to Lazarus. The message isn't different. It's not that the Bible's message is irrelevant or it's not that the Bible is silent. It's that people of modernity, like us, we we don't understand the message. We just don't get it. We're so fleshly that when it hits us in the face, we, we don't know what to do with it. And so hopefully, this message will be a great source of encouragement if you're going through something. And if you're not, you're going to. And so you're going to need it either way. So you look at John 11, massive text, well-known text. What do you do with it? You know, do we preach through it in six weeks? I don't think so. I think I was able to narrow down the main point. So I want to preach the main point of the text and then show you us together how it applies to us. So here's where I think the main point of everything that happens in John 11 is. It's John 11 verse 4. He gets news that Lazarus is sick. The sisters sent to him and he heard it and he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God. It's for the praise of God so that the son may be glorified through it. So this This illness is for God's glory and so that the Son may be glorified through it. So we're going to glorify the Father and the Son in this illness. And the question is, how? And I think the initial answer that most of you would give is, well, raising Lazarus from the dead, of course. And that's part of it. The the, the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead is an intricate part to us seeing the glory of the Father made manifest in the glory of God of the son but it's not all of it the father this is what i think the main point is the father and the son demonstrate their love for us and that the father sends the son to lay down his life and the son comes and lays down his own life in other words this is what i'm saying this passage has more to do with jesus's death than it does lazarus's resurrection And when you go through it the first time, it doesn't seem like that's right. This is about Lazarus being raised from the dead. What do you mean this is more about Jesus dying than it is Lazarus rising? Well, I want to show you that. So we're going to start and break down these things one at a time, and then we'll apply it. So this text is about the father and the son's demonstration of their love. The father demonstrates his love by sending his son to die, and the son demonstrates his love by obeying the father and coming to die for us. So the first things we're going to take is the father and the son. Both of these people, the father and the son, are evident in John 11. When Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, he is saying something about the father in his act of, rise, of raising him from the dead. And we know this because of two, two passages. Luke chapter 4, right? This illness does not lead to death. It's for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Jesus is going to do something in raising Lazarus from the dead that's going to give him glory and his Father glory. Which is why when you go to Luke chapter, I'm sorry, John chapter 11 and verse 40. After Martha's indignation, you know, there's going to be an odor, for he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. Jesus prays to the Father before he raises Lazarus from the dead so that everyone that's there will know that in Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, in Jesus' action, the Father is also acting. Jesus does what he sees the Father do. He says what he hears the Father speak. 
He's not acting on his own accord raising Lazarus. I'm going to raise Lazarus. And when I raise Lazarus, you're going to see my father raise him too. And the point of this is what? So that the people may believe that you sent me. So the Father and the Son are both active in this text. That's why I said the main point is the demonstration not only of Jesus' love for Lazarus, but of the Father's love and the Son's love. Because when Jesus acts in love, so too does the Father. Now, why do I say that this is more about Jesus' death than it is Lazarus' life? So I'm going to give you some, some reasons. And these reasons I'm going to start with are, are what I think are the weakest reasons. So these are the weakest arguments. And, these, and I don't tell you these arguments because they're weak. It's because the, in being weak, they're so strong, they're enough. So if I left you with these weak arguments, you would say, okay, well, I'm convinced. I thoroughly believe that's what's going to happen. So why do I think this te text is talking about Jesus' death? Well, the first reason is in Luke chapter 11, verse 42. Jesus prays to his Father so that the people will know that the Father hears him. And the reason is this. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. Jesus wants the people to know that he is sent by God the Father. The Father sent him. He did not come of his own accord. And this is important because John, as an author, when he talks about the sending of the Father or the sending of the Son by the Father, the death of the Son is really close by. So the most obvious passage is John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For the Father did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world. So God's giving of the Father of the, the, the God's giving of the Son as a sacrifice is preceded immediately by God's sending the Son. So that's that's one of them. Here's another one. We, the, the Son, says that He gives life to His people through His death. This is another common motif that is woven through the gospel. We see it in John chapter 10, verse 10. So if you just turn over probably one page, Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. How do the sheep have life? The good shepherd lays down his life. So when Jesus is imparting life to someone, he does so in the context of, I give life to my sheep because as a good shepherd, I lay down my life for the sheep. Here's the third reason. These are the weakest reasons. This passage is concerned with God's glory, the glory of the Son. And when the glory of the Son is mentioned in John it's predominantly speaking about Jesus' death. So look at a, Luke, a, Luke. Why am I stuck in Luke? John chapter 11 and verse 4. It says, when Jesus heard it, he says, this illness does not lead to death. It's for the glory of God so that the Son may be glorified through it. That's how we know it's for the glory of God and for the glory of the Son. Verse 40. Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Now what's this? What's the glory of God in John? Go to chapter 12 and verses 23 through 28. This is what Jesus said. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, this is a parable. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I've come to this hour. Verse 28. Father, glorify your name. And the crowd that stood there heard it and said it had thundered. 
I'm sorry, then a voice came from heaven and said, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. So those are my weak reasons that I think that this passage is more concerned with the death of Jesus than it is the raising of Lazarus. Those are the weak ones. Here are the strongest links. It begins, this passage begins with a reference to Jesus' death. And unless you've read the other Gospels, you wouldn't catch it because John hasn't given us this reference yet. But look at Luke 11. John 11, verses 1 and 2. <laughs> now a certain man was ill. I'm just kind of keeping on your toes. You know? Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So if you've been with me in the Gospel of John, you know we haven't gotten to this. This has not happened yet. What event is John referring to? Well, go to chapter 12, starting verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom, had ra- whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served. Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. So, so John begins chapter 11 with a reference to Jesus being anointed for his death. So, so John 11 is in the context of death. Jesus' death is referenced. Lazarus' death is going to be realized here in a moment. And then you have this really weird exchange between the disciples and Jesus in verse 7 of chapter 11. It says, After this, he said to his disciples, Let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going there again? And Jesus said, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake, I'm I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. And so Thomas, called the twin, ever the optimist, right? All the Thomases in this church, y'all know who they are. Said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. And so Jesus' death is just screaming to us at the front end of this text. The reference to him being anointed for his burial, Thomas thinks he's a goner. Let's go and die with him. But not only is this text just screaming about Jesus' death on the front end, it's also screaming about Jesus' death on the back end. Nothing else is really said about Lazarus after he's raised from the dead. But we are told this in verse 45 of chapter 11. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he promised that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Verse 53. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Jesus' death is in the front of this passage. Jesus' death is at the end of this passage. And when you get to chapter 12, guess what most of that chapter is concerned with? His death. Mary anoints him for his burial in chapter 12, verses 1 through 
8, look at what happens in verse 9. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he'd raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. And so the death of Jesus Christ is just everywhere. It's at the front of chapter 11. It's at the end of chapter 11. It's at the front of chapter 12. You have the triumphal entry. And then we have that passage I just read in chapter 12, verses 20 through 26. Jesus talking about unless a grain of, of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. Father, save me from this hour. For this purpose, I've come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And he says in verse 32 of chapter 12, And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. This is the ironic thing about this passage. Is that the death, the, the, the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead seals the death of Jesus Christ. That, that one event is why the plan to put him to death was concocted by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That's, that's what the highly ironic point of this Verse. That's the third strongest uh, link. And here is um, and here's the fourth. Jesus ties what he gives to who he is. And it, it doesn't seem like a link at first. It's not terribly obvious. But when Martha says, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Jesus responds to that in verse 23 of chapter 11. Your brother will rise again. And Martha says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who believes, lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you Believe this, John chapter 12, verses 23 through 27. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. In other words, Jesus is going to give life to the world like he did Lazarus by dying. That's the point of saying unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So this resurrection life that we see, parabolically speaking, with Lazarus, is made possible by the death of Jesus Christ. Without the death of Jesus Christ, everyone is raised just like Lazarus to die again. So those are my strong arguments for the context of death. So we've talked about how this is the work of the Father and the Son, the Father sending the Son, the Son laying down His life for His people. And now the last point, and I think the main thrust of this text is, all of this happens to demonstrate that God loves you through the person of Jesus Christ. I mean, it's, John 11 is all about love. And so, it's, it's the main thrust. It says in chapter 11, verse 3, the sister sent to Jesus saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. I mean, we're told right from the beginning that Jesus loves Lazarus. John reinforces that in verse 5. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When Jesus weeps outside the tomb, the Jews say in verse 36, see how he Loved him. Now, 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 the reason this is important is because you're given facts like Jesus loves Lazarus. And then you're given more facts like Jesus let him stay sick. And Jesus let him die. And those propositions, when you, when you place them next to one another seem illogical. They, they don't make sense. How can Jesus love him so much that he let him die? I, the th Phil, this is the, the, the way that John writes. Look at now when Jesus loved Mar now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, verse 5. So 
So, if you were going to write something, if you are going to write, Jeremiah loved Beth, so you would probably write something like, he did the laundry, or he got her a massage, or I don't know, he took her to anthropology, where everything's overpriced, or, I mean, you would, and, and what you would say would be logically consistent with a proposition that precedes it. Jeremiah loves Beth, so he gave her a kiss. But what you have here, the so that follows now Jesus loved Lazarus, Lazarus is not what you would expect. So when he learned that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. He let him die. And what John says is this. He let him die because he loved him. Because Jesus loved him, he sat where he was and let him die. And as humans, we say, that's not love. That's not love. But over and over again in chapter 11, you were hit with this truth. Jesus loved them. And so now you've got to square it away. Okay, I have to be able to explain as a pastor how you can love somebody and let them die. How does God and the Son demonstrate their love for Lazarus in this story? And your immediate response would be what? How's he doing? Somebody. By raising him from the dead, right? That's the immediate response. And the answer to that question is yes, but how? How does, that, how does raising somebody from the dead demonstrate God's love? I mean, how? You don't necessarily have to be loving to raise somebody from the dead if you have that power. You may want a following. And somebody may drop dead and you don't even care about them. But you got the power to raise them, and you raise them from the dead. You say, look at me. How is this raising Lazarus from the dead a demonstration of Christ's love? And here's the answer that I give. Lazarus' resurrection is a demonstration of Christ's love because it is the event that leads to to Christ's death. The disciples were right. Jesus was going back to Judea and he was going to get himself killed. And this explains verses 5 and 6. Why let him die? Why let him die? Jesus lets Lazarus die so he could raise Lazarus from the dead so that he could then Die for Lazarus. Jesus knows what's going on here. He knows what he's doing. He knows that this will seal his death. The disciples were right. That's why that weird verse is at the beginning of chapter 11. Let's go die with him. They're right. And the way you know Jesus is right is because of the way he talks. John chapter 10 and verse 17. Jesus says, for this reason the Father loves me, because I laid down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to raise it up again. Jesus is not along for the ride here. He's not sea-tossed on a ship. He's a captain of the ship. He's dying on his terms. He lets Lazarus die, and he raises him from the dead, and it seals his fate. They put in the plan to kill him, and that's what Jesus was going, that's where he was going all along. That's how Jesus' resurrection of Lazarus from the dead is a demonstration 
of God's love. The very act itself, the resurrection, would lead to his laying down of his life for Lazarus. And so here's three takeaways from that and we're done. And this is where it just really hits home. The measure of Jesus' love for Lazarus is not is not in his resurrection of Lazarus from the dead, but in his death for Lazarus. How do you know that Jesus loves Lazarus? Because he raised him from the dead. That's not the sum total of Christ's love for Lazarus. You know that Christ loved Lazarus because he died for Lazarus. You know that Christ loved Martha because he died for Martha. You know that Christ loved Mary because he died for Mary. If we try to measure Christ's love for us by the circumstances that he's allowed to happen, we end up just like the Jews. See how he loved him. But some said... Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? You see what Jesus is doing here? He's telling us, you can't base the measure of my love for you on whether or not I let you die, or whether or not I heal you, or whether or not I raise you from the dead. The apex of my love for you, the apex of my Father's love for you is that He sent me to die for you and the apex of my love for you is that I came and died for you. That is the measure of God's love. It's not how the circumstances play out. And that's the first takeaway is that we go to the cross. You don't go to the circumstances and question God's love. This is, and it's normal. This is what everybody did. Martha did it. Mary did it. The Jews did it. This is what we do. If you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. But when we do that, we miss the point. Him allowing Lazarus to die so that he could raise him for the dead, so that the Jewish leaders would put a plan in place to crucify Jesus. Points to the death of Jesus, the apex of God's love for Martha, for Mary, for Lazarus, and for us. Here's the second takeaway. In the most difficult circumstances, God proves his love for you and that he sent his son to die for you. And Jesus proves his love for you and that he came and obeyed the Father's will and dies for you. But in your most difficult circumstances, Jesus offers you himself look at 11 verses 23 through 27 let's start in verse 21 actually martha said to jesus lord if you'd been here my brother would not have died but even now i know that whatever you ask from god god will give you jesus said to her he's kind of baiting her here a little bit your brother will rise again and Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the re resurrection on the last day. And look at what Jesus says in verse 25. I am resurrection and life. She's saying, I know this isn't over. I'll see him one day. There'll be a resurrection on that last day. I know he's going to rise again. And Jesus takes her eyes off of a future resurrection and says, you don't need assurance of that. You need me. I am resurrection. I am life. Look at me. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Now, if we had time, we could talk about how illogical these two propositions are, right? Whoever believes in me, even though he dies, he will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Well, how? 
if, if I believe in you and I'm alive, and I'll, I'll, then I'll never die, then how can someone who believes in you die? That, but that's not what, that, that's not what Martha does. She doesn't say, oh, we got a problem. Following the rules of logic, this doesn't make sense. She says, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ. She didn't need propositions. She needed a person. And the reason this is important is because what we think we need when our world is crashing around us are facts to make sense of it all propositions to believe but in the moments of greatest grief and hurt and need you don't need a proposition you need a person she didn't she didn't need Jesus to raise Lazarus from the dead she needed Jesus to be the resurrection from the dead she didn't need a Jesus for, to give Lazarus life, she needed Jesus to be life. And that's a massive difference. I mean, Christian comfort is not merely, it's not found in merely that we will one day be raised to life. That's part of it. That's why Paul says that we don't mourn as those who have no hope. But that's not the sum total. Christian comfort is not merely will one day be raised to life, it's that Jesus is the resurrection and life. So Jesus stands before us in our hour of greatest need and we pray for things like hope and joy and comfort and peace and understanding. And he just gives us himself. We expect him to dispense joy like a Coke machine dispenses Coke. Oh Lord Jesus, I need joy. And you say, oh, Lord Jesus, I need joy. And he walks up to you and he wraps his arms around you and he just hugs you. Because he is joy. He is life. He is hope. So the most difficult of all of our circumstances, Jesus doesn't stand far away and dispense things that might make our lives easier. Like your psychiatrist writes your prescription for Lexapro. It's a terrible analogy. But Jesus is Lexapro. He comes and he enters and he loves. Here's the third takeaway. All these things are true. Jesus' death is the measure of God's love for you and his love for you. In your most difficult circumstances, Jesus offers you himself. But while you wait for those truths to hit, while you wait to be in a place where you can receive the things that God freely gives in the person of Jesus Christ, it is okay to be angry, to be indignant, and to cry. Jesus was all of those things. And he knew what he was going to do. I mean, look at what it says in verse 32. Now Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him. She fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved Literally, he was deeply indignant in his spirit and greatly troubled. Where have you laid him, he said. They said, come and see. Jesus wept. In the middle of all these things that are true, Jesus died to show you his love for you. He lives and reigns to be everything you need in the present circumstance. In the middle of all of these truths and a thousand more that the Bible has to offer, this is perhaps one of the more helpful ones. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be troubled deeply. It is okay to cry while you live in the midst of truth. 
while you live in the midst of waiting for your life to be fixed, while you're waiting for God to put the pieces back together. It's okay. Jesus' resurrection, His life, He came and died for you. He rose for you. He reigns for you. And He waits with you. He, He cries with them. He was indignant with them. He was deeply troubled with them. Beside them. I mean, this is what the incarnation teaches us. The fact that God sends His Son to die for us and to be angry with us and to weep with us and to be perplexed with us and to just live life with us means that He's with us. And while we wait for the resurrection and life to be ours, we struggle, we weep, we, we get angry, and it's okay. And it's okay. You know, why did Jesus weep? Why did, why did he weep? I don't know. But the fact that he did means it's okay for you too as well, even when you know all these truths. It's okay to weep when you know that they will rise again on the last day. It's okay. It's okay to be angry when illness takes your loved one. It's okay. Because we have a God who loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us. And we have a brother, an older brother, who loves us so much that he raised Lazarus from the dead, and in so doing, sealed his own death to show that the measure of his love wasn't the fact that he raised him from the dead. The measure of Christ's love for Lazarus and everyone else is this. He died for Lazarus. He raised Lazarus from the dead so that he could die for him and everybody else. See... See how he loved him. See how he loves you. This is what's wonderful about God's story. You see, we weren't even born yet. We weren't even born yet. And in all of this, Lazarus' sickness, Martha and Mary's grief, all of this was working. For people not yet born. You, me, all in his mind when he let Lazarus die. Knowing what it would happen. So that his message to us could be the same as it was to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. I love you because I die for you. Let's pray. God, thank you for your love and the demonstration of that love for us in the person of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. We thank you, Jesus, that you weren't a bystander in all this. That you have authority to lay down your life. You had authority to lay it down. You had authority to take it up. And you received this charge from your father. Thank you for raising a man from the dead. to put a plan in place that would bring about your death so that you could show Lazarus and every one of us that you love us. Help us not to look at our circumstances, why you didn't move, how fast or how slow you moved, whether or not you moved as the measure of your love for us. Help us to see that the measure of your love is fixed in the heavens. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Help us to see the fact that Jesus being and is life and resurrection and hope. Help us to see that as a gloriously beautiful thing. 
Prepare our hearts, Lord, not for, not for open hands to receive Jesus' gifts, but for open arms to receive his embrace. And while we're confused in this world full of trouble and doubt, angry, upset, fearful, anxious, hurt, troubled, Help us not to feel condemned for weeping, for our anger, for our confusion. But to run to the one who experienced all of these things sinlessly. I pray if there are those who don't know the gospel that they would see the death of Jesus as a gloriously beautiful reality. They would put their faith and trust in him. And that they would receive him as their Lord their joy, their prize, that treasure that's hidden in the field that's worth selling all to purchase it. We pray that you would do this by the power of the Holy Spirit, God. We thank you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.